Hi, everyone. Uh, let's play. OK, uh, I'm glad, great to be here. This has uh, been a wonderful few days. I got here a little early, and I've been having a, a fantastic time. So um, as was discussed, my name's Tom Barkley. I'm a scientist. Um, I've worked at various places throughout my career. And I um, study planets and stars um, and various aspects of astrophysics. Um, I was told uh, people might want to hear a little bit about the story and journey and history. Um, so I, I, I started thinking about where I started. And then as I went through some of my older photos, I, I found some of these, which I thought you guys might get a kick out of. So I was last in India more than 20 years ago. So there's, there's me in, in Agra in front of the Taj Mahal. And there's me in, uh, on the right there with my two sisters in, in Rajasthan. Um, so I keep getting asked, uh, what, have you ever been in India before? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, yes, I've been in, in, in India before, but uh, it's quite a different country now than it was uh, 21 years ago or so when, when I was last there. Um, so what about my journey? Well, my journey in India took me uh, on several different modes of transport, and I, I guess uh, that elephant and camel, um, I continued that, the, the journey via different, different modes of transport, not always uh, of, of such exotic varieties, uh, through various different places uh, throughout my career. I started, I grew up in England, um, in the north of England, um, studied my bachelor's degree in physics, I took a master's in, in radio astronomy, and then I studied for my PhD in, uh, in, in Ireland, um, the country of Ireland. It was from there that I moved to another country, far away, I moved to the United States, I moved to California specifically. So it's a good, you might be asking who am I and why am I here and why was I invited to talk to you? Uh, the reason I'm here is I worked for a number of years on something called the Kepler mission. Uh, there's me there, and there's a big banner of the Kepler mission. That's actually a uh, life-size uh, banner we had made of the Kepler Space Telescope. Um, I was based in Silicon Valley in California at the Ames Research Center. I think many of you have heard of Silicon Valley. It's the home to many, many tech companies. It's also the home to to uh, a big NASA base, one of 10 NASA bases throughout the United States. So I'm going to tell you a lot about Kepler during this next uh, 60 minutes or so. After Kepler ended, the Kepler mission ended in about 2013, um, I started working on a mission that used the same spacecraft but was known as K2. The Kepler mission ended due to um, a failure of some parts, but through a absolutely inspired and, and, and wonderful uh, engineering team. Uh, the engineers are the hero of, of, of this mission. We managed to come up with a, a new mission that, that used the broken spacecraft to do fantastic and wonderful new science, and, and that's still operating to this day. In fact, uh, just to show you, I've I, I done quite well. Um, I was recently awarded the, the NASA um, exceptional Public Service Medal for putting together this mission and being one of the, uh, yeah, um, one of the one of the two science leads uh, of this of this brand new mission. Um, so when I was invited to, to talk to you, I was still working on this mission. I was still um, being the science lead of this mission. Um, but very recently, in fact, April of this year, I packed my bags and put them all into my car. So this is me packed into my car, my mini. Um, and I drove uh, the 3,000 miles, I guess that's 5,000 kilometers from California to Washington, D.C., to start a new position at the Goddard Space Flight Center. So Goddard is in Maryland. It's just outside D.C., so this is me standing on a, under a banner saying welcome. It was the most appropriate image I could possibly think of to, to, to show me moving, um, to work on a brand new space mission called TESS. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the TESS mission uh, relatively soon um, during this talk as well. It's kind of the next progression in the science that I'm doing. Um, TESS, TESS will be launching next year, and, and with Kepler, I, I worked on it after launch. Uh, with TESS, I get to be part of the team that's, that's coming up with and designing and building and launching a, a brand new spacecraft, and, 
And for me, that's very exciting. And because I, I'm working on a brand new mission and working at NASA, I get my NASA uniform. So this is the official NASA uniform up here. This is what we all wear every day to work. No, it, it's not. This is me at a Star Trek convention with some of my NASA friends dressed as various Star Trek characters. Um, this, is, this is actually one small part of this, this test team we were at. We all went to, to the Star Trek convention and met a bunch of the, bunch of the crew. Um, I think that's, that's actually important. Um, a lot of us who study planets and study um, potentially searching for life elsewhere were inspired by science fiction. Um, we hear, I hear from, from writers and, and, and artists that, that they're inspired by science, but I think even more so, science is often inspired by art, and particularly in this case, science fiction. Um, I'm doing what I'm doing because artists and writers and, and filmmakers uh, particularly, and video game uh, makers came up with and thought about life existing elsewhere. They came up with this idea in many ways, and when we went out and searched for it. And so we like to think that perhaps in some small ways we were able to turn science fiction into science. So on to my kind of science part of the talk and, and what I'm going to tell you. Um, what I'm talking about and what I want to do and where my career is going and where I'm passionate is the search for life elsewhere in the galaxy. Are we alone? To me, this is about as profound a question as we can possibly ask. And it's a question I think humans have been asking since humans existed, and probably before we were even humans. We asked, oh, what's over the next hill? What's over the next lake? What's over the next sea? What's over the ocean? What's beyond? We've always wanted to see what is next, and what's the next thing, and what's further than that. And for me, astronomy is, is just the progression of this, and particularly the study of planets, and other planet, planets around other stars particularly, is the progression of this humans wanting to go further and wanting to see what's over the next hill. And in some ways, it's not even traditional science in that you have a hypothesis and you test it. It's a discovery science where you don't know what you're going to find always, but you want to give yourself opportunities to find interesting things and to do things that no one has ever done before. So back to searching for life. There's kind of three ways that um, uh, we, we think that we might find life elsewhere in the galaxy. The first one's in our own solar system. Very important. Uh, NASA and many, many other places are putting considerable efforts into searching for life on our own solar system. A lot of that effort right now is searching uh, around the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. In this example here on the left, you see uh, a moon and you see plumes coming off the moon. I think this is Enceladus. Uh, plumes and thermal vents. Um, in this example, there, there's a solid icy surface, but we know that there's liquid underneath that. There's a huge ocean beneath the surface, and we can see it coming out of these, these thermal vents. This is liquid water elsewhere in our own solar system. So we're going to go and search that, and we're going to go and look to see if there's life there. That's fantastic. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but that's, that's vital. We explore our own solar system. The other way we go and search for life, the second of three ways, is we go and listen. We search for it. We search for intelligent life. We're intelligent. We make signals, maybe signals that would be very difficult for uh, other, other creatures orbiting distant stars to detect, but but we think there may be signals we could detect. So most of that effort's done using radio telescopes uh, in various places, including California and the Arecibo Array. China's doing some of this work right now. Um, and there's quite a lot of, invest of investment going into that, the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's the second way I think is super exciting and very important. And, and really, if if we find intelligent alien life, we can short-circuit all this, all this effort that we're putting into searching, searching elsewhere. But what I focus on is the search for simple life, the search for life around, around other planets that, that we have to go and detect. I'm talking like biological, uh, bacterial, perhaps, level life. 
And that's what I, I want to find. So this third area really started becoming a field in about uh, 1995. And that's the time we first knew of planets orbiting stars outside the solar system. The first planet orbited a star called 51 Peg, and we discovered that in October of 1995. So we're just sort of 22 years uh, post finding the first exoplanet. And I think there's a really interesting, particularly in this room, an interesting generational gap because me and, and many of anyone who's older than me grew up knowing of just the planets in our own solar system, the eight or nine planets, depending on how you fall on the Pluto debate, um, in our own solar system. However, the students in this room, most of the, 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 the students, they will have grown up knowing exoplanets their entire life. Now, that shifted viewpoint, that shifted paradigm of how they think, I think is very exciting for the future. They can, you guys are going to be able to dream of searching and dream of doing things that I think we older people, and I'm not that old, but older aren't going to be able to think of because the idea of planets isn't, isn't something we grew up with. So I think that's an important thing. So this is my, my focus today, is, is talking about uh, planets around other stars. So uh, the way I find planets is using a method called the transit method. So fortunately, um, whilst I was a, a scientist um, in my, my career so far, there was a wonderful example in our own solar system of a transit. Uh, this planet here is Venus. Uh, the bright, I guess, green in this green, but really sort of yellowy orange in the background is the sun. And this movie is showing Venus passing across the surface of our own star. It transits it. Um, I hope some of you managed to see the transit of Venus. Um, if you didn't, there's another one in about 200 years. So eat well and uh, live modestly if you want to see that one. Uh, they happen in pairs. And the, there was one in 2012, one in about 2006 or 2009. Um, and the next one's in about 200 years or so. Um, but, but I think this is a great example of what we want to do on other stars, distant stars. So you can see here the planet passing across the surface of a star. Naturally, the planet's dark because the, all the light comes from the star, and, and if it faces towards you, then it's not blocking any light from the star. Uh, therefore, when a planet passes in front of a star, it's going to block some of the light, and the amount of light it blocks tells you how big the planet is. So that's, that's simply what we're doing. You're also seeing some other things in this movie. Um, hopefully you can see it in somewhat low resolution here. But, but the surface of the star, this isn't just compression here. The surface of the star is genuinely not uniformly bright. And the reason it's not uniformly bright is because stars are hot balls of plasma that have convection going on. So material's moving upwards, material's moving downwards. It's all interacting. There's very strong magnetic fields. You have explosions on the surface of the star. You have all this motion and all this activity. So the star itself is noisy. In signal processing, the star is actually our source of noise when we want to detect many of our transits. So to show, show what we're doing, so, so th this is an example in our own solar system. For stars, you know, if you look up in the night sky, you'll see they're point sources of light. We can't see the disk of a star in almost every case. We just see a single point of light. So instead of seeing an, a movie like this with something passing in front, what you see is the star uh, getting a little bit dimmer. So this is a kind of more schematic movie of that. You see the constant brightness uh, over, as a function of time, and then as the planet passes into the star, across the surface, the star seems to get fainter. It blocks some of the light. The planet moves across the star. It takes several hours to do. Earth would take about 12 hours to cross, pass across the sun. Some take much shorter and some much longer. Um, and then as it moves out again, the star goes back to its normal brightness. And that's what you do. That's what a transit is. And that's the essence of how we detect planets. The reason I love... This field is because it's so simple. It's just basic geometry. There's no complex physics there. Um, and I, I think that's wonderful. However, it doesn't mean it's easy to do. Planets are quite small. Stars are quite big. Here's an example of what Jupiter would look like. Jupiter is about a tenth the radius of the sun. 
Uh, that means because you're taking areas here, you square that, so it's about 100 the um, surface area or the, the projected area of the star, so it blocks about 1% of the light. So if you're looking at the star and you, you, you see a Jupiter, you'd expect 1% of the light to be blocked. Now, Earth, Earth's about a tenth the radius that Jupiter is, so it's a lot smaller. So if you're looking for Earth, you only block a, um, about 100 parts per million of the light. So for every million photons, just 100 get blocked by this planet. You can see how small it is there. It's actually much smaller than many star spots. So this makes it extremely challenging to detect. In fact, when we were designing and developing this mission, it, most people didn't believe that CCD detectors were sensitive enough to do this kind of measurement. But I'll show you later that it turns out that they, they, were, they were sensitive and there was the right equipment. If you want to go smaller than Earth, you can uh, have a look at what Mercury would look like. This is uh, the planet Mercury, uh, a transit of Mercury which happened, fortunately, more frequently than Venus. Um, and that would be even many times smaller because Mercury is about a, a quarter the size or a third the size of, of Earth, so you go another factor of nine smaller. So you see, finding planets, especially rocky planets, is extremely challenging. And it can't be done from Earth. That's key here. Um, you can find larger planets from Earth, and there's been wonderful work done using this method to find larger planets from Earth, but to find signals this small um, from Earth it would be very, very hard. Not least if you want to find planets orbiting on long orbital periods, uh, like year-long orbital periods. That means how long it takes the planet to go around the star. You've got to look, look for an awful long time. Say you want to find one transit of Earth. You'd have to look for an entire year. But you probably want to see it go around several times. So say you want to see it go around four times. That means looking constantly for four years and making sure not to have any breaks of about... 12 hours or more, because otherwise you could, you could miss these transits, these tiny transits. So it's an extremely hard signal processing uh, problem, but we, we built a spacecraft, we built it called Kepler, just to answer this problem, to do this, these kind of measurements. Kepler here was built and launched in 2009 with the goal of determining the fraction of stars in our galaxy that could harbor potentially habitable planets. That's quite a lofty goal for a mission, and we put ourselves towards that, on the line with, with that goal. We went out there and said, this is what we want to do, and if we, don't, if we aren't able to do this extremely challenging thing no one's done before, then we've failed. Our mission has failed. Um, so it was very important, it was very risky, and a lot of people didn't believe we could do this. Uh, here's a short movie just showing um, what our telescope is and, um, and what it looked like. That's the mirror there. It's about a, a one meter mirror across, about 1.2 meter. Um, that's our camera. That's a huge camera. It has um, about 84 detectors on, on that camera. Uh, the camera goes at, at, the, uh, at the top uh, of the, or inside the, the telescope. Um, here's it arriving, ready for launch on the, on the truck. That's how we deliver things on trucks coming out. Uh, so this is our spacecraft. It's about the size of a school bus. Uh, there's our solar panels, uh, and that's just looping. So th this is what we built. This is the, the we call these bunny suits. The, these these suits you wear in clean rooms to make sure you don't get dust on and bits of skin and things like that on on, on any, anything. So look at that camera. Just kind of remember that camera because I'll show some more pictures of what that camera looks like later. So this launched in 2009, in March 2009, and and from there it continued a. a four-year primary mission, looking at the single patch of sky the entire time, the entire four years um, of, that, of this project. So next, I'm going to show you some data. Often we don't show like real data we get from the spacecraft uh, in the public, because it's kind of ugly, and it kind of shows um, how, how, how it's made. I guess in, in the United States, we'd say how the sausage is made, but um, I don't know, maybe how the how the curry is made, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but which, which is often a, a kind of messy process. So this is, this is kind of the data. So what we do is we use this camera 
Essentially, we're taking photos, we, we integrate up, so we take a long exposure, followed by another long exposure, followed by another long exposure. That gives us pictures of stars. We can then take the star and we can measure the brightness of that star over time. So this is what we're seeing here. You see all these dots are a single measurement of a star. This is about 300 days of continuous measurement of a single star and how bright it is. And for the BDIs out there, and the, good, the people who are good at looking, you can probably see where these planets are. You see these dips. You can see them actually regularly. And I'll, I'll bring your eye to see what they look like. There they are. Do you see them? So those are the dips so every 45 days associated with a planet that goes round its star every 45 days. So let's take this transit in particular. Let's zoom in. And you see that nice shape, that that typical transit shape. You have a lot of wiggling, a lot of noise in the data because stars are intrinsically noisy, your spacecraft's noisy, um, your detectors are noisy. Um, but you, you see that very nicely. But if you look even more carefully, you can see this is actually an example of a star with more than one planet. Our star has many planets, so why shouldn't other stars have, have multiple planets? So can you see the very regular little dips around this one? Here they are. So this is indicative of a planet, another planet orbiting the same star. But this planet is extremely close to its star. It goes around very quickly. It actually goes around every 16.8 uh, days, um, about 18 hours or so. Uh, so th this is actually an example of the smallest planet at the time we'd, 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 we'd ever found. This is the first ever planet that we discovered that was rocky. We'd never known of another rocky planet outside of the, the four rocky planets in our own solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So what, what we do, what we like to say, is we turn the pixel-level data, we take the image data in the top left here. That's what a star looks like. It's an ugly, fuzzy blob um, that we don't normally show people. But I, I, I think data is interesting because I spend my time working on data. So of course, I, I should find it interesting. Um, we, we turn that data into this transit shape, and we look at what it looks like, and you see this very nice shape of a planet going in front of its star. You see it very characteristic. This planet happened to be about 40% bigger than Earth. We call these things super-Earths, because they're a little bit bigger than Earth. And this transit in particular takes about two hours, because the planet's so close to its star. And you see in the bottom right here, uh, what we put out to the public are, are nice images of planets. We don't actually take images. Um, Hubble Space Telescope creates beautiful images of planets, but, but our images look like the top left. So we, we put out to the public images like the bottom right. Um, you'll see there's quite a difference between the top left and the bottom right. Um, but we, and this is an example of working with graphic artists, wonderful graphic artists who turn our, our science we collect some of the scientific constraints on what the planet might be like, and they turn that into a vision that really the, the public can connect to, and it helps tell our story of what we're doing. Okay, so that's an example of one planet. How successful have we been at finding planets? Did we, did we determine the frequency of planets in our galaxy? So here's an example of, of, of where we were like in 19... Well, between 1989 and 1995, how many planets do we know? Well, we know the planets in our own solar system. So this is a graph here. Um, some of you will understand, be able to read graphs, some not so good. Um, but understand this is the position here along the, the horizontal axis tells you how fast a planet goes around its star. So closest to the left is goes around quickly, closest to the right goes around slowly. Uh, the, the axis, the uh, vertical axis, tells you how big the planet is. And there's lines for planets in our own solar system. There's lines at one times the size of Earth, so Earth size, about four times the size of Earth, so that's Neptune size, and uh, about 10 times as big as Earth, or 11 times, and that's Jupiter. So this was kind of what we knew up to 1995, when we found our first planet in 19, 1995. And you see the arrows here are pointing to where Earth and Jupiter would be. Uh, from 1995 to 2009, this is up to the launch of Kepler, this is where we stood, and this is what we knew. So what you're seeing here is, is the large blue blob. That's things that orbit their star about every 1,000 days. So this is 
at the region Jupiter is, about five times the distance away from the sun that Earth is. Uh, and you see in the top left what we call the hot Jupiters. These are Jupiter-sized things that orbit their star in just a few days. Very, very unusual things. And you'll see a few smaller planets, but really very little between the size of Earth and, and Neptune. We had very little knowledge of if rocky planets existed, if planets like Earth existed, and extremely few planets towards the Earth region. So does that mean Earth is rare, or does it mean we're just not sensitive to finding Earth-sized things? After several years of the Kepler mission and reprocessing data, this is where we were at. This is the, the combined results of the Kepler mission. We went from, oops, we went from this to here. And you'll see the whole plot is covered in these yellow dots. These yellow dots are planets found by Kepler. Really filling in this region and telling us that planets between, planets between the size of Earth and Neptune, despite not being in our own solar system, are the most common planets out there. We've learned something new about our, our galaxy. We've learned something about how planets form. We've learned that we're somewhat unusual for not having any of these intermediate-sized planets. We've also discovered many, many Earth-sized planets. Um, and we've even the green band here is, is what we call the habitable zone. It's about the temp right distance and temperature from its star where liquid water could exist. Um, and we're even finding planets similar in size to Earth in this region. So what we're saying from this is that planets are common. Planets are everywhere. There's probably more planets than there are stars in our galaxy. And like that other planet I showed you, this is just an example of some of the planets going round, round their stars here. Um, this is showing all the planets we discovered that have more than, uh, all, uh, more than one planet in the system, or all the stellar systems. So what we can move from here is not just we're finding planets, finding many planets orbiting other stars, but we can compare the planets. We can do what we call comparative exoplanetology. We can say, why are these planetary systems different? to ours. Our system is different to many of these. What, what's going on? Why are they different? What's, what are the properties of these planets? So these are, these are all the multiple planet systems. Some of these planets are much bigger than our own, some much smaller, some go around very, very fast. Um, and I think this is really an astounding, astounding plot. This is one of the biggest breakthroughs in, in, in recent years, is, is learning all about the structure of planetary systems and putting ourselves in context and understanding where we were placed. In terms of the planets we discovered, this is, this is what we found. We found we, we got about 1,000 Earth-sized planets. We, we got about a little bit more super-Earth-sized planets, um, many more Neptune-sized planets. And, and we found Jupiter-sized things are extremely rare. Jupiter is not a common thing. We can now say conclusively that we're somewhat unusual for having a Jupiter-sized planet in our solar system. Okay, but the goal, really, what we want to know about is, is, is habitable planets. So I touched upon this thing we call a habitable zone. A habitable zone is just an area that we say, based on our almost zero information, where we think habitable planets might exist. So when we're going to go and spend lots of resources searching for planets, we need to know where we're going to focus our efforts. And to do that, we define something called a habitable zone. And the habitable zone is based upon us and our own planet. We take one sample here and we extrapolate to the entire galaxy. Uh, I don't know how many st statisticians there are in the audience, but extrapolating from a sample size of one is not always an optimal way to do mathematics. But that's what we've done. We've taken the sample size of Earth and we've extrapolated to the, to the entire galaxy and we've said, if we're going to search for places that are habitable, maybe we should start with places where Earth could exist, and life on Earth. I'm not sure it's perfect, but it's, it's the best we, we can think of right now. Um, so what are the things that allow us to exist? Well, two important things and things we can measure are the energy we, we receive from the star, which controls our temperature, and the size of our planet. The reason they're important is because size is fairly simple. If you're too big, you have too much mass, too much gravity, and then when the planets are 
in their early stages of formation, you hold on to lots of hydrogen, lots of helium, probably lots of water vapor, and you produce a gas giant. And we are pretty sure that life as we know it couldn't exist around a gas giant. Certainly, we don't think we could find life as we know it around a gas giant. So we kind of rule out big planets. We also rule out planets that are too small. And that's because you need to be big enough to hold an atmosphere. Without an atmosphere, you're not going to be able to have constituents we think we need for life as we know it. All life on Earth requires an atmosphere. And therefore, we want things to be bigger than about Mars size, because Mars is kind of the limit to where, where you can hold an a, a thick atmosphere. Mars has a very thin atmosphere. Um, maybe that's OK for life, but, but it's right on the boundary of, of where we think it is. In terms of energy, we don't want to be too hot, we don't want to be too cold, we want to be just right. We call this the Goldilocks zone um, because of the children's story, Goldilocks, who didn't want her food too hot or too cold. If you're too hot, you boil off oceans, you boil off any, anything living there, you boil off your atmosphere, and you produce a, a barren planet. If you're too cold, you freeze out all the liquid water and you don't have life on the surface. And we think we probably need life on the surface to be able to detect it. Maybe you can have life under oceans, but that's harder to find. So we want life on the surface, and we want liquid water. And therefore, we want something in the middle. The reason why we pick liquid water is because all life on Earth needs liquid water. And we probably think any alien life needs some kind of solvent. Water's kind of common in our, in our galaxy, so water's probably a pretty good solvent to use, as, use for life. But uh, like I say, this is just an extrapolation. So how have we done in this habitable zone of ours? This, is, this green region is the habitable zone showing the energy received relative to Earth. So you see Earth receiving one times the energy Earth receives. And the, the, the y-axis here is just the, the temperature of the star. Um, and our own stars at the top here, and, and there are smaller stars. Um, it's not too important, but you need to look in the green region. This is the habitable zone region, the region where they receive enough kind of energy. And you're seeing we're really starting to fill up this, this region with planets. We now have about a dozen or so planets that are similar in size to Earth, maybe a little bit bigger um, in this region. Uh, so now we know that there are planets out there that are about the size of Earth in this habitable zone region, so that they're receiving the right kind of energy. This is telling us that Earth-like, or Earth planets similar to Earth in these kind of characteristics are out there. They're relatively common. Um, I think, once again, science is teaching us that we aren't are particularly special. There are places out there like our own. So this is where they fall, and I just wanted to sh show this in a different way. This is where all the different planets are, where we've found them. We call this a Skittles plot, because they look like the candy Skittles. Um, just showing you, th this is our camera. Remember I showed you that picture of the camera? This is the picture of our, of our camera and how it takes a photo of the sky. You have these, this, this is the shape and pattern of our detectors, and that's where all the planets are. Um, up to now, up to about two weeks ago, we know of 3,500 planets orbiting other stars. So in just 22 years, we've gone from knowing um, eight planets to knowing 3,500 planets out there. And not all of these came from Kepler, but about 2,300, 2,300 of this 3,500 came from the Kepler spacecraft. So it's really been the dominant force and the, the dominant mission in, in, in finding new planets and teaching us about our own galaxy. Now, Kepler only looks at a small part of the sky. This is a bit of the Milky Way. This is a bit of our own galaxy. Even this is just a small photograph of, of, of the sky. The sky covers much more than this region here. Um, but Kepler, Kepler, in finding those thousands of planets, only looked in this part of the sky. That's that shape of the camera I told you about. So in that small window, in that small part of the sky, we found thousands of planets. So from that, we can extrapolate and we can predict what's the frequency of planets and what's the frequency of habitable planets orbiting all the other stars. Our galaxy has 100 billion stars in it. If you find just so many planets in such a small region, the numbers must be enormous. And actually, we can calculate those numbers. We have roughly enough statistics now to get fairly good samples and fairly good predictions on the number of planets in our galaxy. 
And the numbers fall out that we think there are at least as many planets as there are stars, and probably more planets than stars. We think planets that are the size of Earth and planets that orbit in this, this habitable zone occur on a frequency of about maybe a third to a half of all the, all the stars out there. So that really says that you multiply 50% of 100 billion, you get a huge number of planets that life could maybe, maybe exist on. Uh, to put it in another perspective, this is our galaxy here. This is the Milky Way. It's actually a photo of our galaxy. Uh, not a photo of our galaxy. It's a, an artist's conception because we live in our galaxy and we can't take a photograph outside it. But that's what we think it might look like. Um, to put it another way, uh, so, so we can ask a question, how far away is our nearest habitable planet? Well, maybe it's something like 10 light years. That's what we guess. But 10 light years for me is, is kind of as meaningless as a million light years. How far away is that in actual distance? So maybe we say the Milky Way is the size of India. So this is a map of India. Imagine you, you, you shrink the Milky Way down to the size of India then how far away would our nearest habitable planet be? Oh, OK, so there we are. That's Guwahati, at least my arrows, roughly. Uh, zoomed in here on the IIT. Um, hopefully, I tried to put an arrow roughly where we are. I'm not sure if it's quite right. Uh, so from there, where would our nearest habitable planet be if the galaxy was the size of India? It would be there. It would be in Debang, Debang? Uh, hostel. Um, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, so you can see, this is just putting it on another scale. This means that we think that our, our nearest neighbors, um, if they're out there, probably orbit not too far away. And we need to go and search there, and I'll, I'll move on to that soon. OK, so, uh, so with that idea um, uh, that we kind of got an idea of the statistics, what about um, the actual good examples that we found, our best planets? Uh, at the top, we see Earth and the Sun there. That's about the right. Uh, uh, these kind of planets are, are, are to scale here. Uh, so I talked earlier about uh, some very hot planets that are rocky. Here's our first example of an Earth-sized planet orbited Kepler 20e. Um, this is the first time we ever knew of an, a planet the size of Earth, uh, truly the size of Earth, uh, in 2011. So not many years ago. Uh, that planet happened to be very hot. Uh, very similar to that time, we also found our first uh, planet in the habitable zone. But that one was a little too big. It was probably had a significant amount of gas. So also not quite right. But you can see, even in the relatively first few years of the mission, we were finding things that kind of bounded this region of, of habitable planets. Um, and it, just a few years ago, just three years ago now, uh, I led a team uh, who discovered the first planet the size of Earth orbiting in the habitable zone of another star. This is Kepler-186f, uh, discovered in April of 2014. Um, and, and another artist's conception, because we, we need artists to, to, to visualize this, showing what we might think this planet would be like. This, this is a planet orbiting a star cooler and smaller than the sun. Um, and it receives a similar amount of energy to the sun, uh, well within the planet's, the planet's habitable zone. So this was a real breakthrough, a kind of pu proof of concept showing us that we think these things are out there. And here's an example of, of one of them we, we found. I'll show you a, a short movie of what we think this planet's like. This is a five-planet system. We know of five planets orbiting in this system. Four of them are close in. They're small planets, but they're hot. Um, and they orbit a, a star that's about half the size and about half the mass of our own star, um, a little bit cooler, so uh, the planet can be the se a little bit closer in and still be habitable. Um, as we zoom out here, we go th towards the habitable zone, and we see this, 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 this planet here. Um, this is a little bit too green, but we tried to, we worked with some, some artists, and we worked with some uh, folks who work on astrobiology, and they try and understand photosynthesis, and what it might be like in alien worlds, and what it might look like. And, and they, you know, they have to extrapolate, but th their best guess was that this, if there's photosynthesis um, on this planet, it would have to be somewhat different from our own planet, and that's because uh, the star's a little redder, the light's a lot more infrared, and therefore the planet might appear more, a bit more yellowy than our own, our own vegetation, which needs, uh, which, which is obviously green, and that's related to the the color of our own star. 
Um, more recently, uh, and this wasn't from the Kepler mission, there was the discovery of seven planets orbiting the same star. Um, this was big news. Like, this is legitimately big science news. It's not often a science story gets the banner of the New York Times, but this, this did. This was the discovery of TRAPPIST-1. Um, hopefully many of you heard about uh, TRAPPIST-1, seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the same star. Uh, I hope most of you heard about it, because I know it, happened, it was news in India, because I found this. At the bottom here, you see the, uh, an Indian newspaper, and you see TRAPPIST-1 at the bottom. I'll zoom it in. So, so if you don't know about this, you clearly haven't been reading the newspaper carefully enough. Um, I don't speak Hindi, so maybe this is deeply offensive, and I, I completely missed something. So hopefully it's, hopefully it's not. I'm not sure. I don't know what newspaper this is. I think it's, uh, hopefully it's nothing too scandalous. Um, so to put this TRAPPIST-1 example, which is, which is really a profoundly exciting system, because with seven planets, it means it's comparable to our own solar system, and we can do things that we, we weren't perhaps able to do before. Um, we can start comparing the planets to each other, and we can start comparing them to our solar system. What's really interesting about these planets is they orbit a star that's completely different to our own star. Our own star's hot and yellow, uh, and very big, relatively big. Um, these planets orbit a star that is extremely small. It's about 10% the size of our own star. It's much, much cooler. And therefore, just like a campfire, if a campfire is cooler to keep warm, you need to be much closer. The planets, in order to keep warm and be habitable, have to be much closer. So you see here, this is the TRAPPIST-1 system and the right distances compared to our own solar system. But I've exploded the TRAPPIST-1 system to be 25 times bigger than it, than it is than the scale is for our own solar system. So these planets are extremely compact, extremely close together, orbiting this kind of strange star. So it's different to our own planetary system. Um, it's not an analog of our own planetary system, but it's teaching us about planetary systems out there and how common they might be. Okay, so... Really, I think, I think this is kind of maybe the halfway point or, or so, maybe not quite. Um, what we've been doing here is um, showing you that planets exist and, and planets are out there and looking about statistics and we're finding a few wonderful examples. But the next step really is to go and study those mo best examples and find better planets. Now we know planets are common and planets are out there. We can look for fantastic examples that we can then study in great detail. This is the kind of story of NASA's exoplanet journey. We started with some ground-based telescopes. We then used the Hubble Space Telescope to find the first transiting planets. Since then, Spitz of the Infrared Telescope did some wonderful work on exoplanets, and Kepler I've talked about in detail. After Kepler here, this, this path is all in the future. So next up, launching next year, are TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which I work on, and the James Webb Space Telescope, really the NASA's successor to Hubble, NASA's next great observatory, a giant mission. So these are coming on board in just a few months, the TESS in about less than six months or so, um, and James Webb in about a year. So the TESS telescope and the TESS space mission um, is designed to find our nearest neighbors. It's designed to find the closest uh, planets orbiting the brightest stars. So it's much smaller than Kepler, and it has four cameras here. You can see them pointing there. And we'll be launching this, this in, in about March um, to survey and find planets around the nearby stars. So I told you how Kepler worked briefly. Kepler pointed the same part of the sky continuously for four years. Tests will look all over the sky. So instead of surveying very, very deep in one part of the sky, it will survey a fairly shallow, a fairly close region um, all the way around our own star. So there's Earth, Earth up there, or the sun, and, and the, the region of the galaxy that we'll be surveying. So instead of surveying about 1 400th of the sky, it's going to survey about 90% of the sky, searching for planets. And that's going to do some really nice things here. This is a 
a little animation I've got uh, showing uh, us in the center and showing distances moving out. So we're zooming out from the solar system here, looking where we might find planets. So the orange dots are with TESS, what we think we'll find with TESS. And we're seeing all these planets close in. And the blue dots here are Kepler. That's where Kepler found planets. And so Kepler, you know, really doing some wonderful work all the way far out, but most of its planets are quite distant, quite difficult to study in detail. It was mainly, it was built to do statistics. It wasn't built to find our best examples. So TESS is, is going to be out there finding the best planets to study. This is kind of showing the same thing. This is uh, distance along the, the, this axis and planet size, and you see a test really focusing on, on these nearby planets um, and things between the size of about one and two times the size of Earth. So this is the rocky planets orbiting the nearest by stars. So this is going to launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 from uh, Cape, uh, Cape Canaveral in... Um, Either between March and June next year, we're still working on the exact date. We're currently planned for about, for about March 20th of next year, uh, partnering with, with the wonderful SpaceX company who are so much fun to work with. Um, so why are, we, why are we finding these planets? So we find all these best examples, these nearby examples, and then we use the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb is, is NASA's next great observatory. It's enormous. TESS is down here, very small. James Webb's about eight meters across. It's the biggest space telescope NASA has ever launched. It's the biggest project NASA uh, astrophysics has, has, ever, has ever done. Um, and it's been many decades in the making, and it's, it's really coming to fruition um, so this is, this is an artist's, uh, this is a design model here, but I can promise you that the spacecraft uh, and the mirror is built and real because that's me, um, and that's the clean room at Goddard Space Flight Center behind us. Um, and, and this is the, the eight meters high. It's actually eight meters wide, but being eight meters wide is too big to fit in, in our rocket, so we have to have the mirror fold. So you can see the mirror folded down the sides here, and that's so it will slot into the, into the, um, the Falcon 9, the SpaceX Falcon 9. Uh, and, and you'll see that the, the various parts here, the, 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 the bit that sticks out from James Webb, let me zoom back. This, this part that comes up, that's where one of the detectors is, um, that, that has to be folded away, so you can see it folded upwards, upwards right there. Um, I don't think in this picture there's no one. You can see too clearly in the clean room there, but, but this thing is huge. It's absolutely mind-blowing enormous. Uh, so this left Goddard Space Flight Center a few months ago and, and went to Houston, Texas, where it's right now. Um, and the wonderful team at uh, Johnson Space Flight Center has been working uh, through the night and, and not going home for the past two weeks, keeping this thing dry um, during the hurricane that hit, that hit Texas. But I can... I'm pleased to report that there was no, there was no damage, despite some, of, some I hear some uh, uh, flood water getting into the room. They managed to keep it isolated, and so this is fully on track and ready, ready to launch. So what's it going to do? How, how are we going to move from knowing these planets to really studying them in detail, and like I promised, we want to do, search for life around other stars? So this is a planet, uh, this is actually an, another image of Venus, um, and just a little bit here, you can see the sunlight in a ring around Venus, even when Venus isn't quite behind the sun, you see a, a ring of yellow, or green, but it should be yellow. Um, and that's because light is shining through the atmosphere of Venus. So when light shines through an atmosphere, it tells you what's in the atmosphere, because the atmosphere is absorbing light. So if there's oxygen in the atmosphere of the planet, then you're going to see oxygen absorbed, when you look at the color of the light coming out, you're going to see part of that light missing. So we can go and look at what that light is, and we can go and see what's missing when the light shines through the planet atmosphere, and we can tell what's in the atmosphere of that planet. Uh, you'll, some of you might recognize this image, but this is, this is simply what we're doing. Light is shining off the planet. It's being reflected off the planet, and it's... it's, it's it's, uh, it's, it's coming through the atmosphere. It's actually propagating through the atmosphere. It's not reflecting. The light's propagating through the atmosphere. Then we put it through what is basically a prism. We look at the color of the light. We, we use a spectrograph, and that tells us something about the planet. So what, how can, what does that tell us, and what can we learn? Here's a nice example of what we would see for three different planets in our own solar system. Three planets we know are extremely diverse. Earth, 
Mars, and Venus. We're, we live on Earth, and we're pretty pleased we don't live on Venus or Mars. I've seen the Martian. I think many of you have, may have seen the Martian. And life on Mars is much too difficult and much too dangerous for me uh, to want to do right now. Um, and we'll need some pretty serious uh, technology developments for when we hopefully in the future go there. Earth, however, is very different. And so when we want to look for life elsewhere, we're going to look for places that remind us a bit of Earth. And so we're going to look for things with um, things like oxygen, things like H2O, things like ozone um, out there, because that tells us things about the planet. So we can compare these and we can see what we look for. Okay, so, so what about Earth's spectrum here? And so this is just telling you what, what the gaps are and what's being absorbed, like I mentioned. What about the gaps here are interesting? So th this is a very famous image. This is the pale blue dot image from, from the Voyager spacecraft that Carl Sagan convinced NASA that they had to take. NASA resisted, but eventually they did it, and it's become one of the most iconic images of our time. So we can look at this light from this tiny dot, this pale blue dot, which is Earth, and we can look at the color of that light, and you see all these bumps and wiggles. That's the different wavelength, that's the different energy, and we can see each of these bumps and wiggles and dips tells us about the color and tells us about the atmosphere of our own planet. And there are things in there that tell us uniquely that there is life out there. There's things like what we call the vegetation jump. There are things caused by vegetation. There's oxygen and ozone in our own atmosphere. And we, we are pretty convinced that almost all the oxygen in our own atmosphere is a result of biological processes. We can look at the blue of the sky. It measures... Uh, total amount of atmosphere. We look at volcanic activity in methane caused by uh, bacteria, primarily in the methane case. So we are a, our atmosphere and our, the fingerprints of our atmosphere are a product of our evolution and our history and the planetary, the life that existed on Earth. We, we're still working on exactly what kind of signatures and what indicators can tell us uniquely about life and what ones are just tentative clues that could be formed by other methods. And this is very uh, exciting ongoing research in the field of astrobiology on something called biomarkers. Okay, so the real step, though, that pale blue dot image, we want a pale blue dot of an exoplanet, another planet. Um, how do we do that? Well, this is, this is exactly, these ratios are going to be right. Here's a, a lighthouse, an extremely bright light, and next to the lighthouse is a planet. It's not actually a planet, it's a firefly. The firefly is the same brightness as the ratio between the star, our own star, and the Earth. And it's kind of the right kind of distance, it's all to scale. So can any of you see this firefly? No, none of you can see it. And that's because the light of the star blinds us and blinds us to this firefly. However, if you turn off the light of the star, there you go, you can see the firefly. And then this is just what we want to do, is the same way we detect another planet. We need to block the light of the star out in order to detect the planet. Here's what we might want to do. Here's, here's an example of a, uh, some image data, an image process data of, 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 of what we'd hope to do. This is a simulation, it's not real. Um, we haven't done this yet, but, but here's an example of an image of what we want to do for our own star, and then we block a lot of the light, and suddenly you can see Saturn and Jupiter orbiting there with the light suppressed. You see all this strange pattern, and that's because this process is very, very hard, and it's very much of a uh, technical engineering, signal processing, computational uh, technique in order to remove all this complex signal. But that's what we want to do. We want to find planetary systems like our own. And that's what we're going to do next at NASA. So this is the, the ongoing journey. I told you about Tess and James Webb. Really. What we do at NASA, we plan in the long term. NASA has a strategy. We have what we want to do, and NASA wants to find life elsewhere. So we're planning very far in the future. We're currently well into the planning and design of the next, next, next generation of, of big, massive um, um, flagship missions. And when we do about one flag flagship mission a decade, so this big circle here of the future of what we're planning now is about a 2035 launch. Um, a long time off, but uh, there's a lot of new technology and a lot of development to do. We're thinking the size of these telescopes here. In the left, there's a Hubble Space Telescope, currently our best space telescope for doing 
astrophysics with. It's been change, change how we think about our, our own our own place in the galaxy, I think. James Webb is there, a little bit bigger than, than, than the Hubble Space Telescope, but we're wanting to build things even bigger. That's an example of a 12, 12 meter telescope that's one of our possible designs for these 2035 missions. Um, we haven't come up with a total design yet. We're thinking somewhere between eight meter and 20 meter um, are being discussed right now. Um, and we're balancing trade-offs between cost and, and science goals. So when we do this, uh, along, along with the uh, mirror technology, but we need to build coronagraphs. So uh, this should show an example of one of the technologies we're developing right now. Um, could you turn the sound up? Mm. A distant star is orbited by two planets. One looks similar to the Earth, the other is a gas giant. When viewed from a distance, the two planets disappear into the glare of their sun. How could we ever find these planets all the way from the Earth? By using a space telescope with a coronagraph to separate starlight from planet light. As the star's light passes through the telescope's large mirrors, it picks up small distortions. Diffraction adds concentric rings to the image we see. To reveal the planets, first a chronograph uses a mask to block much of the star's light and redirect the remaining light to the outer edges. A washer-shaped device can now block most of the rest of the star's light. Because the planet's light comes in at an angle, it misses the mask and passes through the center of the washer. But when we turn up the image signal by collecting more light, we can see that the planets are still hidden under blobs of leftover starlight. To remove these blobs, the chronograph has a special deformable mirror that can change shape by using hundreds of tiny pistons. This can correct distortions in the light beam. As the mirror deforms, the blobs of light as seen in the monitor slowly begin disappearing, finally revealing the brighter of the two planets. Afterwards, the fainter planet also comes into view. We can now see objects more than a billion times fainter than the star. And if the light from these planets is passed through a prism, we can spread it out into rainbows of color. But some colors are missing. They were absorbed by gases in each planet's atmosphere, giving us important clues about their composition. The search for life in the universe has taken a new step forward. That was a wonderful video made by some of our colleagues at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I hope that highlights that to you both the science we need to do and the technology development we need to do. We need the engineers, we need technologists, and the wonderful work telling our story done by the graphic designers, the artists, uh, the video makers, um, really all coming together uh, to, to, to do this new, exciting, and wonderful work. Um, the other technology, and I, I wanted to mention, there are two types of technology to block starlight. One is this coronagraph method. There's actually another that's perhaps um, more exciting and more audacious and extremely difficult to do, and that's what we call the star shade. Um, so instead of having this bit of thing blocking a light internal to the telescope, you could launch something that's external to the uh, satellite. This would fly many millions of miles away from the spacecraft, and this would block the light. Now, it takes a long time to move from star to star, but this is probably the best method we have of blocking starlight. So that's another technology that we're exploring in, in, so, in a huge amount of detail to work out how do we build a, a star shade flying far from the, far from the star. Um, so those two things are gonna, that, one of those two methods, and probably both of those two methods, are how we're gonna take images of planets orbiting other stars. So I'm getting towards the end now, and I wanted to sort of put things into perspective and wrap things up a little bit as we get towards the end. This is just the looking at the night sky, looking at our Milky Way, looking at the many stars out there. Now that we know that most of those stars have planets, we can start to dream big. And it's not just me dreaming big. It's not just me saying, yeah, yeah, sure, we, we think we can find life 
elsewhere. We can find the telltale signs of life elsewhere. NASA's, and she's former now, but NASA's chief scientist, so the head scientist of all of NASA, thinks we're going to find strong indications of life beyond the Earth within a decade and definitive evidence of life in the next 20 to 30 years. I mean, so all of us at NASA are completely engaged and solved into answering this question, are we alone? And hopefully some of you folks out there will be uh, able to, to take things much, much further than we ever have. Where will we be in 100 years? We, we wanted to sort of capture some of these ideas. Uh, most, a lot of this comes from science fiction of, of travel. So this is the, what we call the Exoplanet Travel Bureau. I saw some of these posters actually around as I walked around the campus yesterday. Um, this has been a wonderful success telling, telling us and allowing people to dream of, of where we might go. Uh, the center one there is the one I, I worked on for several years and, and some other images here, really built on science fiction images um, and where we're coming from. Okay, so for my, for my kind of last point, um, I was asked in, as part of my brief to give some advice. How, to get, how do you get here? How do you, how do you get to do one, you know, ex truly exciting work, and, and which I think I get to do. Um, now, here's my advice. Um, this is a movie. This is just a movie of all the planets we know. Um, be lucky. And that might not sound like good advice, but everybody who's made it has got exceptionally lucky, has got a lot of big breaks. Um, they've had things happen to them that have push them in directions they never dreamt of. I've been to uh, many of the keynote speeches here, and I think each one of the keynote people has told you when they've had a break that they've got lucky and they've been able to do something. So that's not very good advice, be lucky. Um, however, I think you have to make your own luck. And by what I mean there is you have to give yourselves opportunities to be lucky. So what I'm showing here is all the planets as if they all orbited one star. However, if we went to look at one star, the probability of seeing a planet around it and see it pass in front of that star is very low. So we went and looked at 150,000 stars simultaneously. We gave ourselves thousands of opportunities to go and be lucky. And we got lucky. We found them. But we made ourselves have that opportunity to get lucky. So in your lives, in your, your careers, I think... Say yes to exciting opportunities. Say when you're scared and nervous of, of, of going somewhere you didn't know you could go or doing something difficult, say yes. Try and do that. Because that's how you get these breaks. That's how you get lucky. And that's how you get to do things truly groundbreaking. And uh, I'll leave you there with, with what I want to, uh, the earth. And I want you to remember this image of the earth. I think it's one of the most beautiful images. This was taken from our Cassini spacecraft um, and shows that where we are and shows our special place. And I hope one day we're going to be seeing images just like this of other special places out there. Thank you. Hello. Anyone who wants to ask a question can come down here. Everyone who wants to ask a question can come down here. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. So I want to ask about the uh, robustness of the... So you are sending the second test uh, space telescope with, uh, like, four cameras. Does it observe the same uh, part of the sky? Like, if you observe the same part of the sky with two different cameras, then you have more robustness about the data you have, uh, like, observed. Um, so this is asking about the way the TESS mission works. That's our new um, upcoming mission. The way TESS works, it has four cameras, um, and they actually look at different parts of the sky. That's how we get this very large field of view coverage. That's how we can look at... Um, 90% of the sky in our two-year primary mission. One camera looks here, one looks here, one looks here, and one looks straight up. Um, and then they look at that part of the sky for 30 days, and then they move round about 30 degrees to look here. Um, and so the, the higher cameras have some overlap because you're all, um, moving around on a pole, and then they move to the next 30 days. Um, but most, there's not too much overlap. Um, 
really what we're going to hope to do later with a, maybe a longer mission is to go back to some of these fields and to follow them up. And, and then to do ground-based observations with big telescopes to confirm what we see. So we're not just seeing something and hoping it's true. We're following things up with other instruments, but, but just that instrument looks at one part of the sky. I want to ask another question. Uh, did you discover any uh, binary star system with planets? Uh, did I discover any binary star system with planets? Oh, man, I, I pulled out the image of uh, Tatooine uh, from Star Wars from my slide because I thought it was getting a bit long. I wish I'd, I'd kept that in now. Yes, we've, we've discovered about 10 uh, planets orbiting binary stars. So what I mean by that is you have two stars. They go round each other. And then you have a planet going round the outside. And why that's exciting is because you'd have double sunsets, um, which would be beautiful. So science, that's actually a wonderful example of where science fiction invented this. And then actually scientists said that's absolutely not possible. And then later on, some scientists worked on um, and said, well, maybe it's possible. And then we went and found them. And we found them. And even up until when we found them, there were people saying these couldn't possibly form. Um, I think the first example in fiction is by a guy called Stanislav Lem. Um, and since then, there have been examples like Gallifrey and, and Tatooine was a very famous one. So yeah, we, we, we've, we've found these and we expect tests to find um, a number more. They're quite difficult to find. They're not especially common. Um, the planets have to be fairly far from the stars. So they need to feel, essentially, feel the gravity um, as if it's a single point, not feel the gravity from both stars um, separately. So, so they're normally they're about the distance um, Earth is from the, from the sun or further than that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. First of all, sir, it was an amazing lecture and truly inspirational. So uh, my question is, let's say, assume, assuming that NASA finds um, an exoplanet which has intelligent life or at least basic basic, uh, basic uh, viruses or ba bacteria. So what does it signify for us? Because if, if you go through any religion or something, they say we are special. And we are blessed that Earth is one of the planet to have life and we have a special place in this universe. So what is the implication and of that, of you finding this on humans and their, the way they look at themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and, and uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. What, what does knowing we're not alone, tell us about our place, our place out there. You know, humans have had to go through the learning we're not special, we're not the only ones throughout their history. Um, I, I, I'm doing what I'm doing because I think there's life out there. I wouldn't spend all this effort if I thought it was unlikely. I think, I think there is, but that's me being hopeful. Um, but uh, throughout our history, we've had to learn to change our, our, our structure and our understanding um, maybe it would have to change belief structures. Maybe it wouldn't. Maybe belief structures are perfectly uh, accommodating and it fits well into that. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a philosopher like that, but, but I, I think this would just be another, another evolution of, of where we, how we focus and how we frame ourselves. We had to go from geocentricism to heliocentricism. This is just a, you know, another step. Thanks. Sir, and one more question. Sir, like uh, recently when I was reading newspaper, I read um, that Stephen Hawking, he warns that uh, just how, how, what happened to the Native Americans when Christopher Columbus landed, the same thing would happen if he too enthusiastically and if we chance upon uh, intelligent life. So how, um, how do you look at that statement and how valid is it? I mean, I, I, I think the statement that, um, that humans can be beastly to other humans that they haven't met before and they can demonize each other and that that might happen if we were to find alien life is, is, is very valid. It's a deep concern and I, I don't have any good answers to it other than we need, to be, we need to be thoughtful and careful and we need to be good to each other and we need to be better to each other now so hopefully we'll be better to each other in the future. Thank you, sir. Have you found any exomoons? Ah, that's a good question. So, so an exomoon is a, is a phrase we've used to, for, for, for moons uh, orbiting other planets. Um, we've actually seen some tentative evidence just in the last few months of an exomoon. 
Um, we hadn't found one until now. And that's not necessarily because we think moons are rare. The moons are very common in our solar system. You know, we have a moon. Um, Mars has some slightly unusual moons, but Mars has moons. And then the giant planets have moons. So moons are probably common. We haven't found an exomoon, I think probably just because they're very difficult to find. Um, the signal for a planet is pretty small. The signal for a moon, it, first it's much smaller, so it's, it's a smaller signal. Secondly, because it goes round the planet, it doesn't occur at these kind of reg regular intervals. So you have to use different algorithms, different methods. It's very hard. Um, but we We've just about seen a tentative signal. There's an, a, a project, I think it's in October, using the Hubble Space Telescope to try and confirm whether, whether the first exomoon has been found. So either we'll, we should know something, something then. It's, it's, it's a lot of active work. Um, and and I, I, I think, I think they, they, must, they must be out there. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, first of all, it was a great evening, sir, to have a lecture. And so my question is that, is it necessary to have uh, these necessary conditions that we have in Earth to have and that the planet that is habitable for another life? Yeah, so, so this, this is going, going back to the um, we think we're special thing again, in that when we search for alien life, we search for life like us. Um, and I think probably... I, I mean, what do I know? But uh, I'm speculating. But I, I, I think alien life is probably going to be extremely different. Um, generally, when we've, we've searched for any kind of new frontier, we've found it to be very different from what we're expecting. Human science has been quite poor at predicting things. Um, that said, we need to move forward somehow. And in an infinite array of parameters, we need to down-select to something manageable. And we've chosen to down-select to something the size of Earth and something that is the, has the same energy that Earth receives from the sun um, in this habitable zone. Um, and beyond that, we're probably going to start to look for things with atmospheres similar to our own. Um, do a, I, I don't know what on Earth is vital for life and what on Earth is just vital for our life because we've evolved to need those things. We've evolved to need oxygen, but that's probably because oxygen was abundant. Um, we've evolved to need, need many other things, but that's probably because those things were there at the right time, and, and we are there because of that. Um, I, one of the things I like to think of is, is that maybe if there's life around these binary star systems, these, these planets in binary star systems, then, then that life would only search for planets orbiting other binary star systems, because that's what they know. And that might not be what's the most common, but we we just search for what what, what we know. So, uh, I have another question, sir. Uh, so there are rumors out that there are alien life already exists, and it has been discovered by some the space agencies, like the uh, Sir Black Knight Telescope, the Black Knight Space uh, Space Club that has been spotted uh, long years ago, in 1960 something. Or so. So can you means. There are rumors that alien life have been already discovered. Oh, is uh, it that true, sir? Well, so we, we don't know of any alien life right now. That we've, we've been searching Mars for a long time, and we've found there's pretty good evidence that there's water on Mars, but we haven't found any definitive life. Yeah, there, there have been some, some interesting signals in the past. Uh, I don't, maybe you're referring to the wow signal. Yeah, the wow signal uh, found from, was it? was Ohio State, I think, discovered this. So the wow signal was, was called that because it was a radio telescope doing SETI work. And someone saw a very interesting signal and wrote the words wow on the bit of paper. Um, we still don't know what the wow signal is. So the wow uh, signal, is it, uh, it is not solved yet? It's not solved. It's, it's a mystery, a 50-plus year mystery of what the wow signal is. Um, we've never seen anything like that before. I don't think we've seen anything again. It's, de it's certainly not solved. There were some ideas just this year that they might have been solved, but I think that's been dismissed uh, now. Um, there's other interesting cases. There's a, there's a star known as Boyajian star, which, which people have speculated there are alien megastructures around. Um, I think reaching for aliens as your first guess is very a bad idea. You want to leave that as the last resort. You want to go through everything else. But that's another example of a, a star and uh, data we're seeing that we intrinsically don't understand. We have really not a good clue about what's going 
on there. So there, there are lots of interesting puzzles, many, many interesting puzzles and cases that, that we're working on. Um, hopefully, maybe one of these will eventually pan out, but I don't think there's anything too strong yet. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That's all. Okay.